So officially, I want to welcome you to the University of St. Thomas for this very special event. My name is Jeannie Buckeye, and I'm serving as moderator today in my capacity as one of the members of the planning committee for this event, and also as a member of the advisory board for the Siena Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture. The Siena Symposium is one of the three sponsors of this mini conference, and we're proud to share sponsorship with two other wonderful groups who serve the Archdiocese and the university so well, the Archbishop Flynn Catechetical Institute and the Science and Theology Network. I'd like to suggest that we begin this afternoon by invoking the guidance and intercession of our university's namesake, St. Thomas Aquinas, and pray as he suggested. Grant, O merciful God, that we may ardently desire, prudently examine, truthfully acknowledge, and perfectly accomplish what is pleasing to thee for the praise and glory of thy name. Amen. In the program you received when you arrived today, you'll find a note card. You were invited to use that card to ask a question of one of our speakers. When the speaker is finished, there will be people moving through the aisles to collect the cards, and then we will um, present the questions to, to each speaker in turn, and uh, we'll do our best to make sure that all of your questions are answered, and probably won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best to get to most of them. There are three other short items I want to mention to you. First, the all-important restrooms. They're out the, the main doors in the back to the left. You'll find the restrooms. Second, though we are scheduled to be together until 5 p.m. today, we will take a 20-minute break at about 3 p.m. with coffees and cookies in the atrium. And finally, if you have not already silenced your phones, this would be a good time to do that. Can we all just get along in our rather jumbled, divided, angry, confusing, and noisy world? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could answer that question with a resounding and confident yes? That almost feels like an impossible dream, though, doesn't it? Just for today, here in this place, let's make it real. Can we all just get along is a plea for calm, reason, respect, and reverence for the truth as we take a hard look at the challenges arising from, one, from what one of our speakers today calls totalitarian temptations in free societies. Yet strengthened by the certain hope, as our other speaker tells us, that we can make sense of things, we can find ourselves, we can find answers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I thank you again for being here and for entering into this conversation. And now I'd like to invite Deborah Savage, who's the, one of the co-founders of the Siena Symposium, to introduce Richard Legutko, our first speaker today. Thank you. So just very quickly, because we want to give as much time as possible to Professor Legutko and Father Spitzer. Um, you have a bio in your program, so I'm not going to read all that. I just want to tell you that I first met Professor Legutko last November when I myself went to Krakow to give a paper at a conference. And he was the last speaker, and I had already read his book, so I was anticipating him showing up on the stage <laughs> for the whole time. And I'd already read his book, The Demon in Democracy, Totalitarian Temptations in Free Societies, and I was very, very excited to hear what he had to say. And it was that moment when he gave his remarks that became, it became so clear to me the truth of his uh, thesis, but also the very real challenge, the real, very real threats and risks we face if we do not stand up for what we know to be true. There is no stopping it. And so that's one reason why we're here, and that's one reason why, as soon as I came back, I said to my colleagues, who always seem to, we seem to work together to organize these conferences, 
um, we have to invite Professor Legutko. And that was actually last, that was in November or so of 2018. So we've been working on that for a year. So I'm very, very happy to introduce Professor Legutko. He's ex an extremely distinguished scholar. I just learned last night that he reads Plato in the Greek. So I kind of, I, I shut up at that point. I thought I'd say something intelligent about Plato, but then I thought maybe I better not. Although I could say something intelligent about Plato. But um, he's written many books. His most recent book that's coming out, I think, or we're still working on getting it out, but it's a book on the pre-Socratics. Yeah. So Professor Bagutko is a real scholar of philosophy. He teaches at the Jagiellonian, and he's also a member of the European Parliament, where he is doing his best to hold back the tide. And so it's my great honor, then, to present Professor Richard Bagutko to you and to hear what he has to say to us about our situation. Professor Legutko will define the problem, and Father Spitzer will give us the solution. Right? Yeah. So by the time we're done, we'll all know what to do. <laughs> Professor Legutko. Thank you, Deborah. And, uh... I thank you and all good people who are behind this uh, uh, conference, and I'm grateful for the invitation. And uh, uh, I have to say how uh, honored I am to uh, to share this uh, platform with Father uh, Spitzer. But as you have just uh, heard, uh, this is not a fair deal because I, mine is an easy part. And, uh, and Father Spitzer will uh, uh, tell us about the uh, solution, which is far, far more difficult. Uh, I will be uh, I will be talking about uh, uh, liberalism, and uh, the, the the title of my talk is uh, "Tyranny of Liberalism." Uh, I will try to uh, explain uh, how and uh, why liberalism uh, has been uh, uh, from the very beginning inimical to freedom, that, uh, that uh, liberalism and freedom uh, do not uh, uh, go uh, together. Uh, so uh, of many uh, problems with liberalism, the most uh, serious one is that it has two faces, so to speak. The first phase is that of a specific political and philosophical doctrine, one of many, having its particular uh, presuppositions, being uh, an object of criticism like any other theoretical conception. And the second phase is that of a, of a super theory that has enforced itself on modern society as the best regulator of human diversity. The liberals say uh, we can and we should take over because we will establish the best rules of cooperation and the most efficient system of distribution of freedom. Each person and group having been allotted as much of it as it is feasible. So, uh, so liberalism has been um, uh, interpreted both as a concrete particular doctrine and as a as the theory of, of modern society. Whenever a politician or an intellectual is brave enough to say that he's against liberalism, he is immediately stigmatized uh, uh, as, a, as a dangerous person because we, we, uh, every uh, decent person has to be uh, liberal or has to accept uh, liberalism as the... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, theory of, of modern society. So those two faces, and this is where the, the essence of the problem lies, have coalesced. Liberalism as a specific political, political doctrine has identified itself with liberalism as a super theory, and under its banner uh, has imposed itself as an uncontested monopolist on modern society. All attempts to deprive liberalism 
of its imperial bent, that is to separate the super theory from its liberal idiosyncrasies, such as John Rawls's uh, political liberalism, uh, have failed. And it does not matter whether liberalism is more Rawlsian, that is more social democratic, or more market-oriented, or even anarcho-libertarian. In each version, the problem remains the same, and it unfolds itself in the following scenario. So now I will try to r reconstruct the, the basic liberal argument, uh, uh, which should explain why the liberals believe that they should rule, uh, 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 should have the, the, the dominant position in modern society. So they say something like this, that uh, liberalism's ideal model is the society in which there is room for possibly every human desire and a life plan, where possibly all occupations and aspirations are allowed, where religions and no religions coexist, where all groups, associations, parties, clubs could peacefully pursue their goals uninhibited either by minute regulations of law or by other groups, associations, parties, clubs, as long as they do not interfere with the rules of cooperation and do not impose their views on others. It is a society in which there are Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and atheists, heterosexuals and homosexuals, genders of innumerable kinds, people of all nationalities or ethnic extractions, conservatives, liberals, socialists, anarchists, communists, and representatives of other political orientations, pornographers, priests, hedonists, moral ascetics, all respecting the common rules. And then liberals continue, well, in practice, we never achieve this ideal model, but we should go as far in this direction as possible so that the maximum of human diversity is preserved. Consequently, the introduction of the liberal system of freedom into an existing society, always remote from this, this model, requires that those that have been disadvantaged receive more free space, while those that have been privileged have some space taken away from them. To achieve this, a form of social engineering must be necessary, if only to upgrade some groups, individuals, opinions, practices, and to restrain others. For instance, to upgrade women uh, and blacks and to restrain the domination of white men or of the so-called patriarchic institutions. To restrain Christianity with its inquisitorial proclivity and to open public space for Muslim communities to get rid of the Robert E. Lee memorials and to increase the number of the uh, alternative uh, 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 heroes of, uh, from American history. This calls for a certain degree of coercion or at least energetic persuasion, usually directed against the bulwarks of conservatism and other forms of petrified privileges, such as entrenched ways of life, allegedly anachronistic beliefs, traditional divisions, supposedly sacrosanct norms, etc. And to elim eliminate their influence, the government, as well as the institutions of civil society, should launch an intensive educational program, preferably starting at the earliest level, for instance, in kindergarten, with a particular emphasis on the language used, also on the proper books, films, games, internet programs that inculcate the mechanisms of a new, freer society. There should be new standards of writing, as open and as inclusive as possible, so that no one should be estranged. But since the laws which secure freedom must change too, there is always a possibility that they should be used against those who stubbornly refuse to abide. Admittedly, such a transformation may be sometimes painful, but its advocates say it is necessary. After all, the entire history of mankind is a history of discrimination. White races against black, men against women, Europeans against non-Europeans, heterosexuals against homosexuals, etc., etc. 
Therefore, the pitfalls that lurk in the process of creating a free society are many, sexism, racism, homophobia, and many others. All of them have to be monitored and curbed. And to achieve this end, the Friends of Freedom should employ all the instruments at their disposal, from law to social ostracism, from education to browbeating. According to the apologists of the new system, the enemies of the transformation process do not deserve compassion. So that's the, uh, how I see the, uh, the uh, argument and the way of thinking. But the, some might say that the, the above description looks like a caricature, but it is not. My, my point is that the liberal order to be implemented it does require social engineering, profound social engineering. And this in turn means not only restructuring of society, but the marginalizing of those who oppose the process. As an example, take, uh, let us take a new concept of marriage, said to be not restrictive, restrictive uh, because no longer defined as a union of one man and one woman, but far more inclusive. The word inclusive is a ridiculous term. I, use, I write it in, uh, in, in inverted commas, but it is the term that uh, has been uh, uh, used. Uh, so this revolutionary change, of course, met with opposition from various uh, groups, and the opponents had a variety of good arguments, biological, moral, historical. Uh, the, att the attachment to the marriage as a union of one man and one woman has been profoundly rooted in social and moral fabric of Western civilization. Polygamy, polyandry, and group marriage were always rejected and condemned, and monogamy makes, but monogamy makes sense uh, only if there are one man and one woman. A union of two men or two women is as good or as bad as a group marriage of several men and several women. So if we accept a group marriage among the people of the same sex, why forbid it for the people of different sexes, especially that sex has changed into gender, another ridiculous word, which we have been told has myriad variations and is as multicolored as a rainbow. To overcome the opposition to the inclusive concept of marriage, the governments, courts, and interest groups used very strong, even brutal means. The marriage and family based on the union of two sexes, until recently regarded as the most solid pillar of the social order, were now called traditional, the implication being that they are on the way out to historical oblivion. The marriage has changed, as one of the liberal scholars put it, from procreational to relational. And, we have been told, it has changed for a reason, as too often it has been an oppressive institution full of domestic violence, husbands raping wives and daughters, women trampled by the patriarchic structures. The only solution was to loosen the legal and customary ties that kept the traditional marriage and family together. The state institutions were equipped with special rights to intervene in cases where they deemed such interventions necessary. Simultaneously, the legal regulations of everything that was connected with the new inclusive marriage became in increasingly intrusive. Once the law was in place, whether through legislation or the court ruling, it was ruthlessly enforced, the argument being that lawlessness could not be allowed under any circumstances. The state does not tolerate theft, tax evasions, or plagiarism. Why should it tolerate contempt for the same-sex marriage law? And indeed, the state institutions proved they did mean it. Wherever the new law was passed, we have observed the same set practices. The consciences were violated, the institutions that disagreed were punished, ostracism towards the dissenters became a widespread practice, Orwellian spectacles were staged to bully potential objectors. To criticize the marriage as a union of a, a man and a woman is now safe and even commendable. To criticize the same-sex marriage law is imprudent and highly risky. Fewer and fewer people can hide behind the clauses of conscience. The adoption centers that resisted were dismantled. 
The priest and pastor's loyal to their calling were threatened with lawsuits and sometimes taken to court. A gigantic propaganda machine, generously supported by the big corporations, was mercilessly recycling people's minds, starting with children at the kindergarten, kindergarten and even earlier. Mass culture duly complied with the general trend. All institutions such as the Catholic Church, as well as moral systems that questioned this revolutionary change were vilified. Those few individuals who dared to say no usually lost their jobs and became an object of verbal, sometimes physical abuse. These and similar processes have had a debilitating effect on people's minds, not only because the propaganda was effective, but primarily because they destroyed the language of communication and reversed the, the meaning of basic concepts. Liberalism from the very beginning made itself the only champion of liberty, pluralism, tolerance, diversity, etc., and the ardent enemy of discrimination, intolerance, exclusion, etc. This etymological trick, the word liberalism, stems from Latin libertas, meaning freedom, worked perfectly. Encyclopedias, handbooks, political historical treatises, all take it for granted that liberalism and freedom go hand in hand. Even our everyday language reflects this. When we say a liberal approach or the law was liberalized, we always associate it with more freedom. No wonder that once liberalism became the ruling doctrine, it was generally assumed that with its increasing influence, we have more and more liberty, pluralism, tolerance, diversity, and we have less and less discrimination, intolerance, exclusion. So all actions dressed up in a liberal jargon were automatically interpreted as being in favor of freedom and against discrimination. No matter how brutal uh, those actions were, no matter how they vi uh, violated consciences, harnessed free inquiry and free debate, how they humiliated people, they were all proclaimed and believed to serve the cause of freedom. The minority that at first had some doubts explained it away by the argument that those bad things happened not but because of liberalism, but in spite of it, like po political correctness. Uh, but it, it put the blame on progressivism, postmodernism, and many other isms, liberalism remaining unblemished. How can liberalism hinder liberty? they asked in disbelief. Regardless of the definitional quarrels, those who were protesting against these scandalous measures were condemned as bigots, reactionaries, fascists, who wanted to turn back the clock of history and reintroduce the Spanish Inquisition. This last sentence is not an exaggeration. This illustrates the standard way how the, uh, the critics of liberalism are uh, uh, talked about by the uh, uh, liberal mainstream. <clears throat> and we have so much got used to this uh, kind of uh, rhetoric that we failed to notice how it affected our language and warped the meaning of the words we are using. Formerly, such concepts as pluralism, diversity, tolerance, openness were intended to soften the relations among people and to temper the strictness of political and moral order. They also served to provide shelter for those who felt excessively dominated by others. Today, those words have acquired a sinister meaning. The erstwhile soft concepts turn into ideological sticks with, with which to beat the, the opponents. They no longer provide any shelter. They intimidate because they acquire the opposite meanings. Pluralism means monopoly, diversity means conformity, tolerance means censorship, and openness means ideological rigidity. At practically all institutions in the entire Western world, with few exceptions, uh, institutions, whether private or public, schools and corporations, their offices uh, have been for some time, offices are responsible for diversity, tolerance, pluralism, etc., all of them are gruesome ideological agencies spreading fear and imposing conformity, not unlike the inglorious predecessor 
in the communist regimes. This is not only a method of oppression. This is a kind of corruption that touches the deepest layer of our thinking faculty and prevents us from making use of it. Since pluralism no longer means a variety of different opinions, but the domination of liberalism, which is believed by its adherents to be pluralist by definition, the ultimate implementation of pluralism will be the absolute triumph of liberalism. And the absolute triumph of liberal, liberalism will be the ultimate implementation of pluralism. It will be a society in which everyone will be a liberal and ipso facto a pluralist. Absolute pluralism will be the absolute monopoly of one ideology. Or to put it differently, the world will be safe for pluralism only if there is a unanimity of opinions. Uh, if, uh, uh, for instance, to give an example, where everyone accepts the new concept of marriage and no one dissents, that will be the absolute triumph of pluralism. Uh, unfortunately, this seemingly absurd conclusion is not a harmless logical quip, but is becoming a fact. Examples are not hard to find. There are countries in Europe, France and Germany being the, the obvious cases, where all the media and state institutions are mono-ideological. And not surprisingly, the absence of a non-liberal platform of opinions, opinions has never become an object of concern for the European Union, the Council of Europe, uh, European and national tribunals or influential NGOs. On the contrary, this has come to be regarded as a natural and positive state of affairs, a model to be emulated by those that are lagging behind. What is considered normal, what rouses concern, is that in some places this monopoly has not been reached yet, or, which is even worse, that somewhere it, has been, uh, it can be subverted. Therefore, the fire is directed at such countries as Poland, where the unanimity of the media disappeared. Uh, there is a real pluralism of opinions with a wide spectrum from left to right. For the ruling liberal orthodoxy, this, apparent, this is apparently a wrong kind of pluralism that should be abolished and it lost territory reconquered. One of the powerful means through which the monopoly sustains itself is its remarkable ability to, to identify ever new enemies that are believed to th threaten freedom from all sides. In fact, the, monopoly, the liberal monopoly feeds itself on what George Orwell called thought crimes. Today's thought crimes, as I mentioned uh, uh, a while ago, are many, and their number is growing. Sexism, racism, Islamophobia, binarism, misogynism, homophobia, are just a few. What is shocking is that this number is far bigger than the number of thought crimes in the communist system, which one should have thought, was unbeatable in its determination to find the enemies and destroy them. But apparently, liberalism surpassed it. The dense system of taboos, thou shalt nots, crooked red lines, has created a most unpleasant environment for the human mind and prevented it from roaming freely out of sheer curiosity. The only prudent strategy one can take in this environment is to avoid ideological booby traps. All of them are deadly. The big question is not only why this is happening, but why there is so little resistance to the massive mendacity that surrounds us. For one thing, liberalism reflection of what it means to be a free man is exiguous. To be free, the liberals say, is to have rights, because only then can one be unhindered to try to become whoever and whatever one wants. A, a corollary of this statement is the minimalist uh, concept of the human self. We should refrain from inscribing too much into human nature, for instance, historical, communal, metaphysical dimensions, because it is for a rights-bearing individual to decide which, if any at all, he would agree to take as his own. Both these assumptions are erroneous and both contribute to the liberals' inability to see how the promise of freedom turns into despotism. The best insights into what it means to be a free man we find in the first book of Politics, where Aristotle makes a distinction between the master and the slave. The slave 
says Aristotle, is one who obeys others because he is incapable either to set any uh, uh, ambitious uh, uh, aims for himself or to select the right means to accomplish such aims. The slave is obedient not so much because he is forced to obey, but because he must depend on others on account of his weak moral constitution. The free man, on the other hand, is someone who rules others, and primarily someone who rules himself, having acquired skills and aptitudes such as courage, justice, resolution, fortitude, magnanimity, self-control, etc. The distinction, as one can see, was moral and anthropological in nature, and had little to do with the endorsement of the institution of slavery as it existed at, in, in Aristotle's time. The fact that someone owned slaves did not make him a free man in the Aristotelian sense. Similarly, the fact that someone became a slave did not necessarily disqualify his moral status of a free man by nature. So is the rights-bearing individual a free man in the classical sense? The problem with this individual is that there is not much in him. Despite occasional associations with the remnants of old and half-forgotten views, the concept of the rights-bearing individual no longer denotes anything concrete, probably out of a belief that it can denote everything. The whole point of the free man in the classical sense uh, was not that he was defined by the sheer absence of obstacles and being defined by rights falls into this category, but that his freedom was positive. He had to meet clear moral criteria that would enable him to direct his life in an objectively valuable way. And for this, he had to have a larger view of himself and of the world around him. Modern philosophy tended to downplay the problem that the ancients thought a major one, how to become a free man and what moral formation one needs to achieve the status. One of the reasons that a lot of people have accepted liberalism is that it did away with the problem altogether. It also ignored what the ancients thought crucial, namely how to have the power over oneself. For the rights-bearing individual, the, uh, the power over oneself is an absurd notion, probably uh, serving to divert uh, the rights-bearing individual from exercising uh, the rights that he has. There is a tendency in liberalism to justify it in opposition to all other political projects, all of them believed to be somehow deficient in freedom. Whatever is not liberal is either authoritarian, despotic, totalitarian, or on the slippery slope to become authoritarian, despotic, and totalitarian. In his well-known essay, essay on the two concepts of liberty, Isaiah Berlin wrote that only negative freedom is a genuine freedom, whereas all positive interpretations of it, and they include almost entire Western philosophy, are dangerously monistic. They inscribe certain moral and spiritual obligations into human nature or into nature as such, which, uh, Isaiah Berlin argues, provides an opportunity for the powers that be to turn them into instruments of political oppression. To secure freedom, it is therefore necessary to suspend all thick views of human nature and of morality. So the liberal looks with suspicion at all thick concepts because it is in them that uh, the liberals locate the sources of political oppression. This view is probably one of the most rigid dogmas that have contaminated our thinking since liberalism started its offensive. In his uh, uh, latest book, Rusty Reno, a well-known Catholic uh, 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 writer, the editor-in-chief of, of uh, First Things, uh, the book is called uh, Re uh, Return of the Strong Gods. In fact, the book is not about return of the strong gods, but it's about expulsion of strong gods. Uh, uh, so in, in, this, in, in, in this book, Rusty Reno made a distinction between weak gods and strong gods. In the modern times, and particularly since the advent of liberalism, we have seen the expulsion of the strong gods and the growing influence of the weak gods. 
Strong, the word strong refers to the view that reality has some basic substance or objective order, and that men are equipped with the, the cognitive faculties that enable them to discover and give a correct account of this order. The strong gods are religion with its attempt to disclose transcendence, the authority of churches, in particular the Catholic Church with her hierarchy, classical metaphysics with its search for the absolute, classical epistemology based on the concept of truth, nationalism grounded in the historical experience of a uh, community, a family as a basic unit of our existence in society. It is these gods that modern society, modern philosophy has criticized, condemned, debunked, demythologized, de deconstructed, weakened, and subjected to many other ordeals of intellectual exorcisms. Uh, the fountainhead of the offensive against the strong gods was what Reno calls post-war consensus. That is a set of views uh, after the World War II, uh, the set of views that was accepted by the Western intellectual and political elites with the intention to secure a, a, a stable, free, and prosperous uh, society. Uh, Rastorinos uh, uh, writes uh, about primarily about the United States, but, but also Euro. in, in Europe, uh, I think the, the, the picture is more complicated. Uh, I mean, the picture of the, in, the intellectual and the uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, situation after World War II. Uh, but I think he, he has a point about the, uh, the, the United States. Uh, and in Europe, I think we have this uh, consensus today. Uh, so the consensus, he, he says, was explicitly anti-fascist and anti-totalitarian. If fascism and to totalitarianism impose rigidity, homogeneity, and closedness, the society anointed by the post-war consensus was to be dynamic, uh, diverse, and open. And to create such a society, it was necessary to abolish a metaphysically grounded sense of order that we have inherited from Christianity and classical philosophy. Not until this sense of order is eliminated, and not until we begin to perceive the world as fluid, evolving, amorphous, with no meaning other than that we confer on, on it, will the society become open. It is roughly this message which the greatest figures uh, of the post-war consensus bequeathed on us and which henceforth delineated the philosophy, philosophical horizon of Western politics. The argument to support the, ex the expulsion of the strong God sounds at first, sound, at first sight commonsensical, but is misleading. The people with the thick selves, nationalists, moral absolutists, or believers in the higher order are intransigent in their staunch convictions and therefore they always try to impose those beliefs on others, being themselves unable to come to a common agreement with them. The liberal man protected by his rights will fear those people, first because he has been taught to fear them as the real villains and the perpetrators of all evil uh, from slavery to concentration camps, and second because he believes himself to be the guardian of openness and compromise. There might be some truth in the argument about the intransigence, but it is beside the point. The theory which gives a strong justification to strong claims may be intransigent, to be sure, but the theory which gives a strong justification to weak claims may be equally or even more intransigent. The liberals, though they have a thin view of the human self, are also intransigent in their views and most unwilling to come to a compromise with anyone tirelessly tracking down all sorts of authoritarianisms. John Locke was far more dogmatic than Edmund Burke, though Locke's view of man was minimalist, whereas Burke's was not. Jean Paul Sartre denied the existence of the human self at all, and he was not a man of compromise and took a rather hard line in his defense of the communist system and China's cultural revolution. The, fundam the fundamental error of this view is that the abolition of the strong gods could not be a weapon, uh, 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 
well, the, 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 the abolition of the strong gods could not be a weapon against totalitarianism because the totalitarian regimes had been fighting those very gods with unparalleled ferocity all along, added everything to liquidate them once and for all. They did away with classical metaphysics. It was not liberalism that started all this. Uh, the, the, totalit the totalitarians they, they were doing exactly the same. They did away with classical metaphysics and epistemology, nation and family, uh, uh, chose religion as the mortal enemy that could not be spared. In the totalitarian society, the gods were weak, not strong. Truth in the classical sense did not exist. Truth was dialectical, as the saying was, right? Dialectical in character contextual, class-determined, historically changing, justified through practice, not through abstraction. The world was am amorphous, malleable, devoid of uh, a meaning other than that confirmed, conferred on it by the historically dominant class. Under the totalitarian regimes, there was nothing one could have recourse to. No objective truth, no rules, no law, no norm, no social practice, no institution, no definition, not even Marxism-Leninism, because one never knew which interpretation was correct under the circumstances. Since being itself was weakened, everything would be subjected to human will, usually the will of the party or the current Politburo, and it's number one. How is it possible, one might wonder, that these basic characteristics of the totalitarian regimes have been missed by the analysts of uh, totalitarianism and by those who try to find the philosophical safeguards that would prevent its reemergence. A possible answer is that the war against the strong gods had been going on for a long time and then the intellectual prejudices against those gods uh, were more important than the diagnosis of, human, of totalitarianism. Marxism was a long-time ally in this war, so was Heideggerianism. Uh, there was no other horizon for Marxists, postmodernists, liberals, Frankfurt School philosophers. Heide well, with Frankfurt School philo philosophers, there might be some uh, exemptions, but uh, existentialists, and no other horizon than that without the strong gods. Uh, no wonder they seized the concept of openness, which offered the possibility, theoretically at least, of avoiding the dismal plight of totalitarianism and at the same time of continuing the war against the main enemy. It is also said that liberals and their allies, by rejecting the strong claims, provide a good philosophical platform to discredit fascism. Well, this is not true. First of all, fascis fascism lost its precise meaning a long time ago. It is now merely a slur applying to anyone or anything that deviates from the liberal consensus. Ever since uh, Stalin became the anti-fascist par excellence, finding oneself in the anti-fascist camp has been a dubious honor. The, the argument that without religion, metaphysics, a strong view of the self, and absolute ethics, we achieve openness seems like another version of the trick described above, namely that a theory hijacks the soft concepts and uses them as an excuse to strengthen the hardline ideology. If this theory claims for itself the values of tolerance and moderation, then its advocates believe they can enforce it on others quite ruthlessly because thereby they, in, they enforce tolerance and moderation in a way replicating Rousseau's idea that the good government should force an individual to be free by subjecting him, by subjecting him to the general will. Why well, cannot deny that the thin view of the self, independent of the strong gods, may serve many purposes that are congenial to the liberals. It may function as an aggressive tool against the fake news. It may generate, generate obsessive hatred, which today one hears in the language of identity politics. It may mobilize supporters and give them some kind of ideological orientation in the world. False, but effectively uniting them for a political strategy. It can destroy the real historical and social bonds among people. 
vulgarize, vulgarize uh, their cultural environment, water down their moral consciences. What it cannot do, however, is to give people a fairly stable sense of freedom. Despite the countless rights and ideological exaltations, despite their unwillingness to seek alternative points of view, the people living in the liberal environment half suspect, half fear, that a lot of what they do is a play they neither wrote nor directed, and the display does not have a genuine imprint, imprint of their own selves. I thank you. Should I stay here? Am I, am I, am I allowed to stay to? here, please? <laughs> if you have a question for Professor Legutko, we'd invite you now to write them on the cards we gave you, and we'll be around to pick them up and uh, keep him with us for a while answering your questions. Did everybody hear that question? Did you hear that? So, are you supposed to repeat the question? Or should I? Uh, well, the, the, the question related to uh, the, the book I uh, uh, published uh, in, in the uh, United States, uh, The Demon in Democracy, in which I uh, draw an, an analogy between uh, certain ideas and practices uh, I experienced under the communist regime and what uh, has been uh, now going on in a, uh, in a uh, liberal democracy. I mean, the, the entire book is uh, uh, about uh, that. Uh, uh, what, so it would be uh, difficult for me to give a, a con concise uh, uh, argument that would uh, uh, say, well, everything which I uh, stated in the book, but but roughly speaking, what uh, uh, struck me uh, was that uh, the society, um, the, 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 the communist society, was uh, uh, entirely politicized. Everything was political. Uh, everything had some relation, not a close relation to communist politics and communist I ideology. There was no uh, art, there was communist art or socialist art, at least at a certain moment. There was not a family, but a, uh, but a, but, but a communist family, right? Everything was communist or socialist or had to be. And it was, it was difficult to, uh, uh, to find shelter to find a place that uh, you were untouched and, and, and unmolested by communist pol politics and communist I ideology. And when, I, when I observed in, in, a, in a liberal uh, society, both in Eastern Europe, in my country, uh, but also in, in Western Europe, uh, in, in which I have been working for the last uh, 10 or, or 11 years, is that again, the, 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 the uh, liberal democracy, it is a tendency in the liberal democracy to make everything liberal and democratic or liberal uh, uh, democratic. Everything, the entire society, all institutions. Family has to become liberal democratic. Otherwise, it's been uh, uh, criticized. The churches uh, are becoming liberal democratic. It's expected that they will be 
uh, uh, we liberal dem democratic. Even, and this is a, a, a remarkable contribution of the Western societies, sex, which was supposed to be the most private of private matters, have become political. Mind you, the toilets, that's the American contribution. The toilets, right, have become political. Uh, I mean, th this is something really scary uh, for me. Uh, I made a point in the book that uh, the, the Western political system, which we tend to call democracy, we talk about Western, Western democracies, right? Or European democracies or Western democracies. In fact, until recently, they were not democracies at all. They were what uh, one might uh, call, uh, uh, going back to uh, Plato, uh, Plato's laws and, and, and Aristotle, mixed regimes. That is, the, these were the, the political system where, of course, a large part was democratic, right? The, the election of the government. And, and, but there were institutions that were neither liberal nor democratic. Family was, was never liberal or, or, the, or democratic. Family has its own nature, right? The churches, th therefore, in a, in a mixed regime, you are aware there are some other points of view. And there are some uh, uh, other, well, mo mo moral systems of certain sensitivities, which you have to uh, uh, respect. Uh, whereas in, in a liberal democracy with, with its uh, egalitarian impetus, uh, you just, uh, 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 well, you, you, you think that uh, uh, everything has to become and will ultimately become liberal and democratic and uh, egalitarian. We, we do not tolerate hierarchy. Even the universities have changed. University, another institution that has never been uh, 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 democratic, uh, and uh, one of the problems is democracy that it, it destroys education because education is not democratic. The, uh, the education is based on uh, asymmetry. There are those who teach and there are those who are being taught. And once we change it and we turn it into a democratic organism, then we are we we, we have a problem. And uh, th th therefore, the, the, the best schools were created at the times that were more aristocratic, right? more sensitive to the value of hierarchy, whereas all, any democratic country that there is have problems with education. Ev every country. Uh, uh, precisely because of this. And it's, it's pol politically uh, highly risky nowadays to, to make any sensible... Uh, reform of education because people will take to the streets and uh, uh, they, they, a lot of people just uh, do not uh, understand the, the, the proper nature of, uh, of, of education and it's very convenient for the pol politician to mobilize uh, pol political uh, support around uh, uh, inefficient models of education. But uh, I, I was a uh, uh, a minister of education for for a short while, so I kind of sp speak from uh, from uh, experience. But generally, contrary to people, uh, to uh, John Dewey, uh, Karl Popper said, I believe that uh, democracy is the the enemy of education. Or, uh, uh, well, yes, democracy is the enemy of of education. Don't quote me on that. I'm going to quote you. <laughs> Um, Professor, can a true liberal exist? Uh, <clears throat> well, I know quite a lot of them, and uh, uh, they are usually very difficult people to, to talk to. And be, uh, but uh, uh, I, in, in my in my book, I quote. Uh, uh, Dostoevsky, right, who was one of the first to discover that uh, uh, in, in Russia, 19th century Russia, it was a rather a gruesome society, and there was, but there was a lot of intellectual life, right, and, uh, and artistic life, and uh, you could argue with anyone. You could argue with na na Narodniks, uh, 
socialist uh, conservatives, there is one group that you couldn't argue with, and the liberals. I mean, they were uh, they, they are so uh, you know full of themselves that uh, uh, that they are not uh, uh, able to talk to. But uh, it's, it's difficult to talk to them. But uh, uh, but but sometimes. What, what, what I mentioned is this, the etymological connection between uh, uh, liberalism and liberty. So usually I'm uh, asked, uh, well, how about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, right? Uh, do you include him uh, in this uh, well, group of uh, bad people? And I, I said, no, he was in, he was in favor of uh, liberty. I mean, he was advocating some kind of a mixed regime in the United States. If you, I mean, all of you must have read uh, Democracy in, in America. I mean, he, the, the book uh, starts with, uh, uh, he expresses his enthusiasm for a new society that is uh, free from the feudal heritage that he remembers from uh, his uh, native land, from France and generally from Europe, and his full enthusiasm for uh, for the new uh, society here, right at this uh, side of the uh, Atlantic, but the, the book ends on a pessimistic note because he he sees that uh, uh, there is more and more of this egalitarian democratic thinking, and the book ends with a rather pessimistic vision of the future uh, society and uh, what he calls uh, uh, the despotism bienveillant et doux. Uh, despotism which is benevolent and mild and and that is some something uh, that uh, we in various countries we are uh, having it's not so mild um, but uh, because it's not as uh, awful as uh, as it, it was uh, in the communist or, or, or German social you know, national socialist uh, system but uh, in, in that respect it's it's, it's milder Would you advocate the use of censorship in a non-liberal society in order to defend its thick understanding of human nature? What other tools do we have in the struggle against liberalism? Well, the, uh, well first of all, th there is censorship nowadays. Uh, even, uh, well, the, the, the internet, which was... Uh, for some time believed to be the, 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 the freest space one can think of, is not free. I mean, there is, there is a growing censorship. There are certain things you cannot say, and you, if, if you say them, you're punished uh, in, in, in various ways. Uh, there is censorship in the, in the European Parliament. Uh, we many times we have been uh, censored. We organize an, uh, 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 I, I remember um, uh, several exhibitions, and uh, some of the texts were considered un unacceptable and were deleted, or a black tape was put on it. Like uh, we, I, we we organized an exhibition on the outbreak of World War Two, and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and there was a sentence that uh, in, in the September uh, 1939, Poland was uh, left alone, abandoned by uh, her allies, and that was deleted. You cannot say that Poland was abandoned by her allies in, in September uh, 1939. Uh, uh, and uh, many examples like, like it. It's, it's not called censorship, of course. It's not. It's that's that's a, what's amazing about today's newspeak is that it, it avoids all these uh, uh, bad words and speaks and then of well of, uh, of openness, right? Of being inclusive in in terms of being uh, for the sake of being inclusive, uh, they did not want to offend the uh, Poland's allies uh, from the times of the outbreak of World War Two. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, I think some kind of uh, of uh, censorship uh, uh, should be uh, imposed, and probably um, 
they are the instruments in law, but they are not uh, uh, executed. Take pornography, for, for example. I mean, there are regulations which restrict the access to, to, to pornography. Perhaps with the internet, it's, it would be more difficult. But, uh, but one of the things which I do not ac accept uh, in, in nowadays is this uh, uh, sense of uh, historical inevitability that uh, it's inevitable. I mean, you, you, you just cannot do anything because it's, it's the price of freedom. Uh, and I can hear intellectuals, sophisticated, refi intellectuals, refined minds, uh, uh, defending uh, uh, not pornography, but uh, the lack of any restrictions to the distribution uh, of, of, of pornography, because that would, uh, they said, that would jeopardize freedom if we try to restrict it. Well, first of all, I find it rather pathetic that the intellectuals defend pornographers. I never heard of pornographers defending uh, f philosophers. So, uh, <laughs> uh, pornographers will manage. I mean, they are quite powerful. Why, why should we help them? And uh, so, there are, there are all sorts of people, all, so all sorts of measures, I think, that, uh, that, that should be uh, taken for, a, for, for a, in, a, in a good society. And, uh, and we should not feel blackmailed by this uh, uh, slippery slope argument that uh, once you uh, uh, make some restrictions, then you are on a slippery slope will lead you to the uh, Spanish Inquisition and concentration camps. One of the best ways to offer effective resistance, personally and institutionally, Uh, well, wow. <laughs> well, as I, I think we have to uh, we have to start with the with the language, with the way we uh, speak and we write, because it reflects what we think. So, do not be, let us not be deluded by this awful uh, newspeak that is being uh, used. Uh, there is so so much mendacity no, no, nowadays because of uh, because of this language. Uh, we we all um, um, most of us have come to uh, accept that uh, well uh, uh, the, the diversity uh, is what uh, it should mean, but uh, we fail to see that it means something else. So let us not let us not use their language, and uh, let, let us try to uh, to uh, to define the concepts that we use, and to let us debunk this this false use of uh, of concept uh, of uh, of the the concepts that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I used by the the, the, the modern new, new speak, uh, especially as I try to show, uh, as I try to show in my paper, we have the, this concept have uh, acquired the opposite meaning. Uh, so if uh, well, somebody comes up to you and says uh, you have to uh, uh, stick to the uh, certain. Uh, uh, standard way of using pronouns, uh, you have to say, go away. I mean, how I use uh, pronouns is my problem. Even the communism didn't control the use of pronouns. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, so, so you shouldn't really black me by this di uh, diversity nonsense because it's not diversity at all. I mean, it's the opposite of diversity. Uh, so let, let's uh, first of all let's let's start with, with what we can do as individuals or as as, as members of a, of of a community. And uh, as, I, as I said, it all starts with the language. Once we uh, uh, liberate ourselves from this new speak, uh, uh, they will be not. Uh, there, there won't be much they they, they could do to us. What role does the dispensing of the doctrine of original sin play in the utopian 
tendencies found in communism and liberal democracy? Uh, well, we uh, th there's a there's an, an old uh, uh, a, w a well known theory, I think that uh, that that says that the, the left uh, the left uh, uh, politics, the left wing or the left philosophy, usually emphasizes, uh, uh, if not the goodness of uh, human nature then uh, a possibility of endless improvement and perfectibility of uh, human nature. And that's, uh, that's what uh, we have seen in, uh, in communism and in, in uh, uh, liberal democracy. In each case, it was not really perfectibility of human nature, but it was the, uh, the, the, the molding of a particular new particular uh, model of, uh, of a uh, human being, whereas the, the conservative side usually emphasizes pe pe well, people's uh, uh, sinfulness. I mean, we are, we are pe people who are, who are sinful, and uh, yes, we can improve, uh, but, uh, but the generally, the, uh, the, the the, the, the original, not the, the, the corruption of, of, of human uh, nature, uh, makes it uh, uh, difficult to construct any uh, absolute uh, perfect blueprint of a political uh, order. Uh, so the conservative side uh, uh, usually emphasize both of the, of the things. I mean, a good political order is something that uh, takes into account the, the sinfulness of uh, human beings, but on the other hand, it uh, tries to introduce institutions, mechanisms that would uh, uh, reduce the, uh, the, the effect of this uh, 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 sinfulness. It's amazing, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, good, uh, uh, I'm not good at, at theology at all, but I, I just wonder, how it is in, in Protestant theology, which, which uh, so much stressed the, the importance of original sin, that uh, uh, how, how it was that they turned into uh, sort of anything goes approach. Uh, th there must be some reason why the evolution, which started the way it did, ended up in this. Uh, 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 kind of rosy uh, view that we are all good, and uh, uh, but the, the, the Catholics never made that that mistake. Also, also, there was a tendency, as you know better than I do, in Catholicism, like uh, liberation uh, theology, that uh, the, the sin is not in human beings, but it's in the institutions and social arrangements. So once you change the social arrangements and the institutions, the, uh, well, the, the, the people will be uh, good. But, uh, but liberation theology has been, uh, I think, rightly criticized by the, the popes. Why is there so little public resistance to liberalism, even from good Christians and conservatives? Is it fear or apathy or not knowing how to respond or something else? I, I, think, it's, I think it's all of these. And uh, uh, I can see in, in my country, but also elsewhere, that a lot of uh, people in the church and the lay, lay people and the, the clergy, uh, they would like to be a part of the mainstream, right? They will be a part of what is going on. They, they, they fear uh, to be left behind. So, so they, they believe that the, the, the development history is, uh, is like a train that goes forward and you do not want to be left behind. You have to be with this, uh, the, 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 the march of uh, uh, progress. Uh, 
which I think is an uh, erroneous uh, uh, approach. Uh, that uh, the, the, the truth of the Catholic uh, uh, doctrine and the, the truth of the, of the Church uh, is, is is not historical. I mean, we we shouldn't really be. Uh, worried about being called uh, anachronistic, uh, uh, I think catching up with the new things is a real danger. Because if we try to catch up with the new developments, uh, we will not win the, the, the competition. They are, they are groups, they are ideas, they are those who will do much better. In, uh, um, in this going forward, uh, our, uh, uh, our uh, obligation rather is to provide the uh, universal framework that is valid regardless of the, uh, uh, the, the times we are living in. It's as valid uh, now as it was a thousand years ago. Of course, there might be a new uh, uh, language in which to, to express it, but this, this is cosmetics, it's not the, the, the essence uh, of the problem. So, so yes, the, 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 some, some, of the, some of the priests and, and, and a lot of uh, uh, lay people uh, fear being called uh, backward, uh, conservative, uh, and would like to, uh, to march with the mainstream for the into the you know, ra radiant future, and, and liberal, liberal is uh, uh, well, liberal is, is, is liberty, and uh, some of the priests do not uh, want to uh, look uh, very uh, uh, gloomy, inquisitorial. So you know, that sort of buddy, 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 right? Uh, 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 attitude, but which is wrong. And uh, it's it's not what what people expect, uh, uh, and, and 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 in the in the countries in the places where the, the priests and the, the lay people that don't make their mistake, these are the places where Catholicism is strongest. Does liberalism require conformity? Uh, yes, I think it, it it does. I mean, when you when you uh, when you read uh, uh, John Locke, uh, uh, and you try to describe uh, a Lockean man, right, a, a Lockean character, it's so uninteresting. I mean, it's uh, there is nothing there sp specific. Uh, the difference the difference is. Uh, among people, and the whole point of diversity is hierarchy. I mean, your uh, your being different from your uh, neighbors, uh, from your friends, depends uh, what sort of hierarchy you uh, want to uh, accept and want to prove your uh, yourself. I mean, in 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 what in in which. Uh, uh, virtues or aspirations you want to excel, and uh, and, lib and liberalism is uh, uh, in in that sense is is devoid of any sense of uh, of hierarchy. Uh, th therefore, uh, liberalism also democracy mm, they generate uh, conformity. Uh, if you are a dissenter in a democratic uh, society, you are considered an insane person. Uh, if, if the majority believes, whether it's numerical majority or it's, or it's political majority or whatever, especially nowadays in the modern society, when we have the rule of the mainstream, and the mainstream comprises both the left and the right and the center, uh, the mainstream is the same here in the United States as in any other uh, country, country of the Western civilization, be it New Zealand or, or France or even the, the, the United uh, uh, Kingdom. And if all major media say the same things, 
right? You can find it in Washington Post, in in, in London, no, no, London Times is a different story, but uh, uh, it's not what it, what it used to be, right? Le, uh, Le Monde and, and, and Politico Corriere della Sera, if they all say the same things and have the same type of judgment of what, what is going on, very few people would... Uh, uh, agree to the conclusion that they may be wrong. How is it possible that, I mean, if everybody says the same, it must be right. They must be right. And uh, so whoever dissents is considered to be an insane person, right? A, 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 a maverick. If uh, in, uh, in the communist regime, the dissenters were put to prison, to prison right, or were uh, 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 taken to court or arrested uh, or, ha or harassed, and, uh, and here well, some of them are, but generally the, the, there, is a, uh, there is a suspicion that there is something wrong with them. I mean, if, if, if they dissent from everybody be believes to be true. Uh, and it, it's extremely dangerous. Actually, uh, it, it's uh, something that has been very well described in the history of, of philosophy, in Tocqueville, among other uh, 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 writers. So, uh, in a liberal, uh, in, 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 li in a liberal, in a liberal society, uh, we all talk about uh, liberty, about pluralism, but we are all the same, and uh, and. Uh, and, and well, a, a tolerant person will say, I am tolerant and you are not tolerant, so I will not let you speak. I am, I am a pluralist and you are not, so you do not deserve to be, uh, to be uh, heard. So the, the end the result of it is, well, you have to be one of the mainstream, otherwise you won't be even allowed to speak. You have been wonderful to answer so many questions of such a variety. I'm going to I'm going to give you one now that I think may make your heart sing. What is happening in Poland now? Well, something about po politics, right? Current politics. Well, we we uh, so we because uh, the, 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 my party has recently won the elections uh, for the second time. Uh, we have the absolute majority. Uh, we scored a very good result, the best results uh, any political party in Poland has since the fall of the communist regime. So uh, we are uh, quite uh, satisfied and we are in the, the process of uh, forming the, the government. We will have elections, presidential elections next year. Uh, uh, we we have a pa parliamentary system rather than a presidential, but but uh, but the, the 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 role of the president is not uh, uh, ornamental sim simply. So it will be uh, also uh, quite a, a, a political uh, event. And in in Europe, uh, we are now in the process of forming the European Commission. European Commission, which is kind of European uh, government, and a lot will depend. Uh, you know, po Poland has been singled out as the the, the bad boy uh, in Poland and, and Hungary, and uh, the European Union has been very uh, nasty to us. Uh, the, the the European Commission, and a, a lot will depend on. Uh, uh, how the, this European Commission will look like and what the relations will be between the, the new government and the new uh, Commission. There, there will be the same, some, some of the people in the Commission will, be, will continue the work. Some of our ministers in the Polish government probably will also retain the, uh, their jobs. So in, in a sense, there will be a continuity, but uh, we hope for some uh, uh, new opening in the relations between uh, Poland and the EU well uh, we'll see the opposition is uh, the opposition is in disarray uh, and they are very angry and frustrated because they lost the elections and and generally the a lot of uh, intellectuals and artists uh, and university professors hate us
I mean, they 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 really do, and uh, and uh, even my my own university is not quite uh, happy that uh, I'm still a university professor. Uh, there is not much they can do about it. I cannot I cannot be fired. I think we should call it a day for you at this afternoon anyway, call it in the afternoon and, and break at this point to take a short, have a short cup of coffee and cookies in the atrium and then return here at 3.30 for the rest of our program. Thank you so much. Thank you.